My name is Janet Greeley and I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Human Sciences. Uh, and uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this, this evening uh, on behalf of Macquarie University. Uh, may, may I just take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Darug people, and to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and to pass those respects to any indig indigenous guests who may be here this evening. Uh, the Faculty of Human Sciences uh, at Macquarie University is a, a very interesting group. We have six departments uh, and several areas of research uh, concentration. The departments include areas such as early childhood, education, health professions, psychology, cognitive science and linguistics. Uh, and our speaker this evening is involved in several of them. We conduct research and teach across the broad areas of health, education, languages and the mind. Many of our academic programs prepare graduates to work in a profession such as clinical audiology or speech pathology, uh, and uh, as well as uh, academically trained people who go on to be, become teachers or do PhDs and become researchers. Much of our research, uh, as it is throughout Macquarie, is interdisciplinary working on the boundaries between disciplines to find innovative solutions to complex problems. And our speaker this evening is a prime example of such a renaissance person. Professor Catherine Demuth came to Macquarie University in 2010 after 20 years of teaching and research at Brown University in the United States. She has extensive experience in child language acquisition and is director of the Child Language Lab here at Macquarie, a synergistic group who pursue research in this area. She is a member of the Department of Linguistics, the Center for Language Sciences, and the Center of Excellence for Cognition and its Disorders. Now, Professor Demuth's lab is here in this fabulous new facility, uh, the Australian Hearing Hub, and I imagine this might be a first visit to this building for many of you? Yes, it, it just opened uh, officially in April this year, although staff were moving in as early as January. Uh, it's it's a, a wonderful uh, initiative on the part of the university. Uh, it was partly funded by a, a $40 million grant from the Australian Higher Education Fund, the Commonwealth Government, to which we added quite a few more dollars. Uh, and, and it's a, an, an incubator of a sort where we have academic departments and research centres alongside industry partners. So within this facility we have audiology and speech pathology. We have a clinic, a state-of-the-art clinic on the ground floor and our audiology teaching facilities are just across the hall. We have uh, also clinics in uh, clinical psychology and neuropsychology and a, a center for emotional health. Uh, the Australian Center for Cognition and its Disorders is on the third floor and part of this floor as well. Uh, and uh, alongside, oh and also in the basement, <laughs> we have uh, the Center for Nanofabrication. Um, our industry partners include Australian Hearing, who have the best view in the building. They're on the fifth floor, so their, their corporate headquarters is upstairs. And just below them on the fourth floor is their uh, research arm, the, the National Acoustic Laboratories. Then on the, the ground floor, we have partners, the Royal Institute for Deaf and Blind Children, the Sydney Cochlear Implant Centre, uh, and, and, uh, and the Shepherd Centre, and the Shepherd Centre. And I was speaking with Catherine earlier, and uh, she said it's just fabulous. And of course, as you know, we have uh, the international headquarters for Cochlear the Limited uh, in a building just next door. So Catherine said she'd just come from having a meeting over at Cochlear, where they then came back to the Shepherd Center and are discussing opportunities for research collaboration. So I guess the concept is working already. But, but inside the building, we have, we, we're focusing on both research, education, and service to the public. So um, our, uh, in particular, our students have a wonderful opportunity to be learning amongst the top researchers in the field in wonderful new facilities, and then to take what they learn and practice it in the clinic downstairs. So if, if any of you or your family or friends have any issues with speech or hearing or any psychological problems, you can <laughs> come along. <laughs> well, no, no, we all have them. Um, you, you can come along. We, we have clinical facilities here uh, in, this, in this wonderful new building. And so we're ve very proud of the facility. Uh, now, diverting from Professor Demuth, Demuth for a moment. Uh, as I said, Catherine represents several of the major areas that are, that are in this building. And, and her research uh, attempts to 
better understand the various factors influencing how children perceive, process, and produce different aspects of language, and with a particular focus on preschoolers. Uh, Catherine's research is carried out, as I said, in, in this wonderful new facility, and much of her lab's work is cross-linguistic. She's using insights from the structure of different languages to better understand the mechanisms underlying the process of language learning. And since coming to Australia, Catherine has also become involved in research in Indigenous languages, which I think has been a really exciting new endeavour for you, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, she's been working on gaining a better understanding of the nature of the input to children's hearing and the influence this has on the language learning process. Much of Catherine's current research involves work with bilingual children, as well as those with language delay or hearing loss where the findings may have implications for designing more effective therapeutic interventions. So I'm sure you will be very interested to hear what Catherine has to say this evening, and it is my great pleasure to invite Professor Catherine Demuth to the podium to present her lecture on Discovering How Children Learn Language. Catherine, welcome. Thank you, Janet, for that nice introduction. And thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, it truly is a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, great new <coughs> building. So as John said, most of my work uh, has, over hmm, the past many years, has dealt with children's language development. And in that process, we're, we've been very interested, especially in the younger years, when children are just learning language. So uh, when they begin to talk, when they begin to get their first words, um, and then as they begin to progress a little bit older. That being said, we are also quite interested in what happens when children get to school as well. Uh, what happens with their language development then? And this becomes really important, especially for children who may have somewhat slower speech development. This could be possibly, not always, but possibly in a case where children are developing bilingually, it could be where they're maybe learning English for the first time. It could be where children are, um, have some language delay of some sort. About 7%, 5 to 7% of Australian ch children have what we call language delay or specific language impairment uh, that causes a, a slowing of the language learning process. Um, this can present a challenge when children get to school. Uh, and then there are obviously uh, children with hearing loss, many of whom are um, assessed or given different types of therapeutic in intervention right here in this very building. And so increasingly we're beginning to start to do research with um, those types of children also, uh, especially where they, you know, both early aspects of their language development and when they get to school, it becomes a critical issue in how their language is actually developing so that they can achieve as good as possible educational outcomes. But of course, to study uh, any of these populations, we need to have some idea of normative development. What happens in typically developing monolingual children who are just learning language every day? And that's a pretty fascinating process. So that's most of what I will talk about today. Um, and you'll, I think you'll see the implications for um, uh, other populations as well. So, how does, how does language acquisition take place? Well, all typically developing ch children learn language. Some people think that this happens because someone teaches them, but actually, that's not necessary. We have to learn how to ride a bike. We have to learn mathematics. It helps to go to school to learn mathematics. But to learn language, so long as we actually hear some language and people talk to us, we just learn it. It takes a while. A one-year-old doesn't speak like an adult. But uh, by three or four, children are typically fairly intelligible. Uh, by eight or nine, they're doing pretty well. But it actually takes a little bit longer before children actually become adult-like in their language use. So I imagine here in the audience we have a few parents. 
oh, a few, yeah. Uh, grandparents, oh, a few grandparents too. Um, uh, contemplating becoming a parent? Uh, not yet. Okay, okay. So, pardon? And teachers, and teachers as well, yes. So, um, uh, anybody who has had uh, close contact with a child has some idea, especially smaller children, some idea of what is going on in the language acquisition process. But, um, on the other hand, just like, um, say you've, you're a gardener, unless you happen to really get into flowers, maybe you just sort of see flowers out there and you don't know what they are. Well, likewise, with children's language development, the more you learn about it, if you become really tuned in to what they're doing, you can see bits and pieces of what's going on in the language learning process, like an expert would be, uh, say, an expert gardener. Okay? So hopefully after this talk, the next time you see a young child, you'll be a little bit more aware of what's going on in their, in their speech. So, one of the issues that we are very concerned with is how children learn language. It happens sort of naturally, but what are the processes or the mechanisms by which this takes place? Um, so, we, it turns out this is a gradual process. It actually starts in utero. So, by 25 weeks, the auditory system is actually quite well developed. That means that even during pregnancy, the, um, the fetus can actually hear a fair amount. This is what we call filtered speech. It doesn't sound like what you can hear right, me saying right now, but it's, it's, you get the higher level pitch. So you hear something like Okay? No words, but you get a higher level prosodic sound. Is that okay? why that asks you five years ago all the time when you were pregnant? Uh, well, possibly. We don't really know about that, but that's a good question. But certainly it may be, have a calming effect on, on the child, yes. Um, so after birth then, there's very, very rapid uh, brain development and language development goes along with that. So in particular around the age of one and a half or two, uh, there's a lot of myelinization going on where a lot of the white matter is being laid down in the brain and it's at that point that there's a little word spurt. A lot of uh, words start developing so a child can learn up to uh, may have only about 50 words at that point, and then after that, they start acquiring 10 or 20 words a day. Okay, so there's this very rapid word spurt at that point, and this we think is linked to, in, in part, to actually what's going on in the brain. But of course, language learning isn't really complete until the early teens, and this is probably also due to the fact that the brain continues to mature. So, what do infants know about language? Well, if they're hearing some of these prosodic aspects of speech even before birth, then we would expect them to be sensitive to some of these higher level prosodic um, issues. And indeed, uh, from very early on, even four days, when we test in a certain way, we can test to see what, uh, if children are sensitive to, say, their mother's language as opposed to someone else's language, um, indeed we see that they show a difference. So they're sensitive to some of these aspects of prosodic higher structure. So they can tell the difference between English and Cantonese, or English and French. Okay. Um, by four months, they can distinguish tones. So if you pay Mandarin tones, sort of ma versus ma, something like that, I'm not a native speaker, Someone here in the audience can probably do better than I do, but you, they can begin to distinguish those types of tones. Uh, at six months, they can begin to distinguish vowels and to recognize their own name. <coughs> if you think about it, a child's own name is very high frequency. They hear it a lot. They hear it over and over and over and over again. And that's one of the first words that children actually recognize. 
shortly after that, they start doing what we call canonical babbling. Not just ah, uh, uh, but with a consonant and vowel. Ba, 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 ba. Okay. Um, and some of the sounds that then first emerge tend to be the sounds that are found in the ambient language, the language that the child is actually is exposed to. By eight months, they can distinguish different types of consonants. And they are beginning to tune into the consonant sounds that are characteristic of the language that they will be learning. And at 12 months, or sometimes or even earlier, precocious children start maybe even at 11 months to actually use their first words. Okay. But to be able to pick words out of the speech stream, children have to solve what we call the word segmentation problem. I suspect some of you, let's see, how many of you speak more than one language? Hmm, quite a few, right. How many of you have been exposed to another language that you don't speak very well? Uh, yeah, quite a few, right. So. If you think about that, depending on what language it was, you may have had this exact same word segmentation problem. All right, for an English speaker listening to French, it's really hard to determine where the word boundaries are, where one word starts and another one ends. This is partly because French has a very different <coughs> prosodic structure than English does. Whereas for an English speaker listening to German, uh, even if you don't understand anything, you can sort of tell where the words are because German is sort of like English in its rhythmic patterns. Okay? So the word segmentation problem is a, is a real challenge and there's a lot of research going on both in computational modeling but also in infant studies trying to figure out how infants begin to segment the first words. So in a sense, that's one of the building blocks. How can you learn the grammar of a language unless you actually know what the bits and pieces of the language are? So um, if we look at a spectrogram here, this is a spectrogram and a waveform, okay? This is what some of the acoustics of language actually sound like, or look like when we, when we put them out there. We can analyze these spectrograms and waveforms. Um, how many words would you say are there? Any idea? One, four, five, six. Oh, going up. Seven, anyone? Seven? <laughs> okay, it's, it's maybe hard to tell. Um, you can see some spaces there, but what do the spaces mean? Are those really markers between words? Well, stops. Ah, but you know some linguistics, don't you? Ah, yes. So, so let's look here. If we gloss this then, um, we can see that uh, this is what was said. Okay. Ah, yes. So we have by, uh, okay, by a uh, large, and then we have a little uh, gap between large and b, bear, but, but even after the b, there's a little gap, a little silence, bear, and then the r, roll, okay, but it goes bear a love, it, it bleeds right into the next word, okay, and then between the of and the, uh, so the beginning of a stop consonant, there's a little um, space because the airflow stops. That's what I, why it's called the stop consonant, like t, g, k. All of those are stops as opposed to l, r, those, those more liquid sounds. Um, and then at the end of good and then beer, there's two stops there, and that's where you get a little stop. Okay? So, so even here you can see that sometimes words just flow right one into another. There's not a big break between words like there is when we write. When we write, there's white space between those words, but that's not how we speak. So for the infant, the infant doesn't read. Even a four-year-old typically doesn't read. So they have to break into language 
without having the advantage of literacy at all. Um, and as we know, four-year-olds are pretty, you can carry on a pretty good conversation with a four-year-old, okay? So, um, all of this begins to get at what we call phonology, or the sound system of language. And a lot of people think that phonology is just segments, just k, t, whatever. Um, and if a child can produce all of those segments, then they, their phonology is fine. They've acquired phonology. Whereas, actually, phonology is a lot of things that just gets lumped into this one term, okay? So phonology is, are the sounds, like are the segments, the consonants and vowels, but phonology also is syllable structure, how syllables are formed. Um, word structure, how many syllables are in a word? Uh, stress, the stress system and the rhythm of language. Some of these things that tiny infants are already picking up on. Intonation and prosody, prosodic structure, sort of the melody, uh, forming questions versus statements that deals with intonation. Or tone, tonal languages like Mandarin and Thai have tones. Um, so all of that is phonology. And as you can see, some of this is really important for learning language. Um, if you don't have access to all of these different levels of phonology, you're not going to get very far in being able to speak a language. You can also see that some of these issues are quite important for um, being able to uh, hear and perceive language. So for a child with um, hearing loss, if they're not getting some of this very, very early information at very young ages, then there will be a delay in learning the uh, phon phonological structure of the language, and that can have a big knock-on effect in learning words, being able to find words, being able to understand words and longer sentences when it's all put together. So that's one of the reasons why we're quite interested in um, understanding better what happens with learning the early phonological system, and it has direct relevance for early intervention, early amplification of children with hearing loss, um, and identifying other types of problems that various children might have with learning language. Phonology then, or aspects of phonology, also play a big role in um, uh, some of the phonetics or the acoustics of, of sound. They also interact with other higher levels of, of structure of language, like the morphology, all the little bits and pieces, grammatical morphology, also with syntax or the grammar of the language, and also with semantics or the meaning of language. So in English, uh, we can use prosody to give different types of meaning. So if I were to say, uh, let's see, um, what time is it? then you would say, oh, well, I want to know what time it is. OK, fine. If I were to say, what time is it? That carries a slightly different meaning, OK? But you know that as a good, competent speaker of English. Um, a child has to learn that prosody can be used for giving slightly different meanings to an utterance. Um, and so when this type of learning doesn't take place, then you can see that there might be complications or communication breakdowns. So, in phonological development, we know that infants are sensitive to, it doesn't mean that they know it all, but they're sensitive to intonation and rhythm and stress. Uh, by one year, they are learning language-specific types of sounds, consonants and vowels. By two years, they're learning about the syllable structures and word structures of words. But by three to five years, they're still mastering all of these different levels of structure. So um, one of the uh, various types of things that happens with learning phonology is also learning about some of the phonological processes. And these phonological processes tend to take place at the edges of words. So in a language like English, we can add 
the, uh, a plural morpheme to the end of the word, make it plural. Okay, so how do we do that? We add S. Ooh. Oh, what do we add? Do we add an S or do we add Z? Ah, well, let's see. So cats, we add cats. So we add an S. What about dogs? Z. Okay, so orthographically we add an S. But the actual sound we add is a Z, right? So here we have the um, phonetic representation of these forms. So here we have uh, cats uh, with a, a Z, uh, sorry, cats with an F. But here, after a voiced consonant, a G, we add a Z. So yes, we add S, but we think of adding S just because you know, that's what we do orthographically. But when you really, really, really think about it and listen to yourself, we add a Z there. And you can feel a Z if you, if you put your hand here and say Z, Z, Z. It should vibrate. You should feel the voicing here. It will vibrate Z, Z. As opposed to if you just say S, 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 S. There's nothing. Okay, so S is voiceless. It doesn't, it, your vocal folds don't vibrate. But if you say Z, Z then it does. Okay, Z. So, yes, we add S to form a plural, but in fact, it depends on the sound that we it comes before it as to what we actually add. But you probably never knew that. No, it, it's, uh, it's a part of English and it's part of every dialect of English. Yes, so it's a productive process, but it's totally subconscious. So all of us have learned this as a speaker of English, uh, people learn this without ever thinking about it. It's a very natural process. And we can see that this generalizes. It's a, it's a robust characteristic of English because if we look at the past tense, we actually find exactly the same thing. So here, what do we add? You know, ED for the past tense, but actually we don't. We add T for a voiceless sound, kicked. And we add a D in the um, case where, where there's a G again, we add the voiced sound, okay? So again, it depends on what the form of the word is as to which, what sound we actually add, even though in our head, we think that these are the same thing. So, so what we think of in our head is really the representation. So this would be the phonological or the morphological representation. It's what we know about language. Okay. And the way it comes out, so this would be our competence, what we actually know about language, what we actually say could be performance. Okay. So this is a voicing simulation process. Um, morphemes take on the voicing uh, characteristic of the previous consonant. And again, we can see how and when children learn this. We can conduct perception experiments or production experiments and uh, get a good idea of how this develops. Children then must learn the language, um, uh, the phonology of the language that they're exposed to. Uh, so the role of input, what they actually hear, is critical in this process. But they don't just repeat what they say. And so there's some people who propose usage-based theories of how language development takes place, where basically children just repeat what they hear. But we know that they don't just do that. Um, so it turns out that children construct their own grammars. They say funny things. So um, you've probably heard a child uh, try and say the word banana, and what do they say? Nana. Okay? What? Why do they say nana? Well, they, uh, most words in English start with a stressed syllable. Um, so there aren't many words that start with an unstressed syllable. So children just drop off that first syllable and they make it like all the other words in English. And they do that until about two and a half. So tomato becomes tomato, etc. cetera, okay? Um, so uh, this is a very common uh, process. They often leave off grammatical morphemes. So if they want to say something like he walk, it may just come out as walks, I'm oh, sorry, walk, 
okay, with no pronoun and no S. Or uh, there's a case in my family, apparently my mother was reading through my grandfather's letters, and it turns out that um, Aunt Toady, that was talking about Aunt Toady, we, uh, we all knew Aunt Toady, well, it turns out Aunt Toady's real name was Sophie, and we never knew. But it turns out that my grandfather couldn't, you know, when he was two, he couldn't say s, s, because it's a later acquired sound, and he couldn't say f, f, because that's a hard one too, and so it's later acquired. So what did he say? He changed them both to T. T is easy. So Sophie became Toady, and the name stuck. <laughs> so it's a really nice illustration of, yeah, there's some sounds that are harder, um, and so the child are just replace them with things that they can say. Um, so, so all these are cases where we know that children don't just repeat what they hear. Um, they have their own system. You know, my grandfather and many other children can probably produce S, but they don't. Um, so um, there's often uh, simple types of syllable structures in children's early speech. Uh, so a dog will be produced without its final consonant. So you get something like da. Um, so, uh, for a word like steps, you'll get something like maybe first of all te, and then tep, and then teps, and then steps. And so there'll be various stages of development as the, there are more consonant clusters at the beginning of a word and more consonant clusters finally acquired at the end of the word. Um, and this really depends on the structure of the language being acquired. So I'll give you just a little clip here from one of our studies. And uh, this child says dog and cat, but without the final consonants. So just listen. This is an American child, okay? What is it? What says woof woof woof? Who says woof woof woof? Yeah. The dog does, and there's the cat again. Okay, so you can even see her mouth. Da. There was no good there. Okay, and the same with ka. Okay, so she's just at this consonant vowel stage of development. These are studies I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit. These are um, studies where uh, we mic the child and we mic the parent, and they have radio mics, like what I have on now. Um, and so they can move around, and so we can get good recordings of a child. A child this age, we can't really do language production experiments with, but this way we can capture exactly what they're saying, and then we can um, go ahead and analyze it later. Here's another um, example from another child. Um, so the other thing uh, children do a lot is leave off grammatical morphemes. Um, we're actually studying a lot about this now because it's also a problem for um, children with language delay, with some bilinguals depending on their first language, and also with children with hearing loss. Um, and um, so here you see that the um, child systematically leaves off the, um, uh, uh, the grammatical morphemes in pink there, even though the mother actually uses it. Listen. The dog eats the ball, that's right. Okay, a nice eat. Okay, no S there at all. Um, so only at a later point in development then do these grammatical morphemes start to be used. So, how do we determine what children really know? How much is competence and how much is performance? There's anecdotal uh, evidence that uh, children will say things like, oh, there's the sip. So the parent will say, oh, you want the sip? No, I want the sip, okay? Where they can't say ship, but they know when they hear it that that's not the right word, okay? So that gives us some idea, again, that they know what's going on. They're just not um, uh, saying it correctly. So we can test this using large corpora of spontaneous <coughs> speech, or we can run uh, different types of experiments. We can also do cross-linguistic studies and uh, develop typically developing, or uh, examine speech of typically developing monolinguals or other populations. 
So one of the things I've done a lot of is collect spontaneous speech corpora, uh, where we collect and analyze this type of data and put it, actually all of this is now posted on a, a database that's in the public domain for other researchers to use. It's very labor intensive work. Um, some of these corpora took me about six years to complete. Um, so it really is an infrastructure type of uh, undertaking uh, that then provides data for a lot of, of uh, other studies to be done. And one of the reasons we did some of this is because we wanted to look at children's language acquisition between the ages of one and two. And there wasn't any data in the public domain that we could analyze. So we had to go collect our own data to look at the emergence of early phonological and morphological um, development. So these are really good for um, looking at overall patterns of development. Uh, they're similar to patterns amongst children, but of course there are individual differences as well. Children develop at different rates. They learn to walk at different times. They get their teeth at different times. They learn to talk at different times. Um, so uh, one has to take the individual differences and put them together um, with the overall patterns. It's, this type of data is also good for exploring uh, lesser known languages or lesser studied languages where we don't really know where to begin. It can provide pilot data for follow-up um, types of more focused studies. Um, so these are some of the two corpora that I've been in, involved with, English and French. Um, and uh, you saw some of the recordings there. We usually do, for these, bi-weekly, bi one-hour audio and video recordings. Um, and then uh, phonetically transcribe the children's speech, but we have the audio and the videotapes to go back then and do all kinds of analyses as well. We can also conduct controlled experiments, and we can do this in many, many different types of ways. We can uh, look at uh, uh, speech perception, we can conduct comprehension and sentence processing types of studies, and we can conduct elicited production or elicited imitation tasks. To do this, uh, it really depends on what the research question is and the age of the child, since some of the methods we use are very age dependent. So one of the research questions we've been focusing on um, over the past several years is why children's use of these grammatical morphemes is so variable. Lots of people have thought in the past that this is due to children's lack of knowledge about grammar, about the syntax of the language, or lack of understanding about meaning or the semantics of language. Um, but a lot of our research indicates that uh, some of this variability is due to children still developing phonology. Uh, so some of the uh, factors that influence whether a child will use a grammatical morpheme or not depend on what phonological context it might actually appear in in a sentence. And then we can use this to make predictions about other languages where we'd expect there to be language learning difficulties or challenges. So just to give you a, a sense of flavor here of what this looks like, um, it turns out that articles are first used in a context where they immediately follow another word that is stressed. So something like, I saw the piggy, it's sort of a rhythmic unit, saw the, saw the piggy. Um, whereas when uh, the article in pink here follows uh, a word that is already uh, stressed and unstressed, like wanted, uh, they, they tend to omit the article. Inflections are first used in really simple words uh, where there's just a consonant and a vowel and then you add S, so consonant, vowel, S. Um, so something like sees, children tend to use it earlier than in something like hits that already has a consonant, vowel, consonant, and then you add another consonant. So you end up with two consonants there at the end of the word and they tend to leave uh, the morpheme off. Um, also, we found uh, children more likely to use these in utterance final position. So now he runs. Runs tends to be produced correctly, uh, whereas not so much when it occurs in the middle of a sentence. And furthermore, uh, children are better at producing these things when the sentences are short. Um, so they're more likely to produce runs in something like he runs fast 
than they are in something like he runs to the store every day. So you can see here, uh, there's many, many different factors that may influence when and how a child will use a chromatic morphine. And typically what happens uh, in, in clinical types of studies, if a speech pathologist is assessing what a child knows about language, none of these things are controlled for. Okay. So it turns out we can also test our hypotheses about what we think is going on cross-linguistically. So some of my work has been conducted in Southern Africa, uh, where I've worked on Bantu languages. Uh, these have lots of grammatical morphemes. They have interesting syntactic structure. And they also have tone, not quite like Mandarin does, but uh, nonetheless a tonal uh, system as well. And uh, here's just some of, the, some of the many volunteers that we've had in some of our studies. In these uh, languages, there's also prefixes and it turns out children are more likely to use these uh, prefixes when the word is monosyllabic. So in the first case, where the um, morpheme is blue there, they're more likely to use the um, morpheme in this case, but where it follows a word that already has two syllables, they tend to leave it out. Okay. So again, it's the same morpheme, but a different context. They produce it in one case and leave it out in the other case. The same, we find exactly the same phenomenon in French. French is a totally different, unrelated language. Um, it has a different, as I've said, a different prosodic structure um, to English, and yet we find exactly the same <coughs> phenomena. Children are more likely to use uh, articles and determiners when the noun is monosyllabic than when it comes before a disyllabic noun. Okay? Exactly the same thing. So this is pretty interesting. Very different languages, very different prosodic structures, and yet totally similar types of phenomena. Uh, it's this type of evidence that gives us some idea that what we are finding is a really robust um, type of finding. We know very little about what happens uh, in the acquisition of indigenous languages. We're only beginning to explore this issue. We need more grant funding to be able to code the data <laughs> that we have collected. Uh, but these languages have lots of grammatical morphemes, and little is known about the input that children hear in these contexts or how these are acquired. This is especially critical for indigenous languages since many of them are being lost now. Um, there are grandparents and sometimes parents who speak these languages, but we know little about what uh, parents and grandparents are actually speaking to children and what children are actually learning. Uh, but uh, many of the languages in Australia are now being lost. So uh, in addition to collecting uh, uh, corpora and uh, running certain types of experiments, we can really uh, tune in to very specific issues that um, children may be learning. Here we can uh, use a looking fixation task to test uh, children's preference for sounds or words, or sometimes even grammatical morphemes. So here, if you listen here, we can see how long a child looks at a screen and see if they notice the difference between these two sounds. Uh, so here we... There he cries. That sound should sound okay. We'll listen to this one. There he cried. Uh, that should sound not as good. There's no S there on the end. So one question <coughs> is, do the children notice the difference? Okay, That can give us some idea that they are actually tuning in to some of these fine-grained um, morphological aspects of language. Um, here we have an eye-tracking study. We have... Uh, Actually, the lab is just down the hall here uh, for doing eye tracking studies with little children. Um, and here we can see if they're finding the words in the sentence. So here he's looking at the screen, two pictures. And the peaks. And the peaks. Okay. And this is a bilingual child, so we can see at what age they can do this compared to monolingual children. Uh, we can then also conduct uh, several different types of comprehension or sentence processing um, uh, experiments. 
uh, looking at uh, sentence understanding, looking at grammaticality, again with a missing S there, Tommy likes mangoes as opposed to Tommy like mangoes, do they notice the difference? And we can also uh, conduct brain imaging studies using um, EEG, um, electrophysiological types of measures, or MEG, um, angloencephalitis, uh, uh, encephalograph types of studies, and we, those machines we also have right upstairs in this building. So this provides us with uh, ideas of what's going on unconsciously in the brain as in response to grammatical and ungrammatical sentences. So here we have uh, uh, a picture identification test, show me the picture where, and you can see the child pointing, or we can have a grammaticality test uh, to puppets, who said it best, who gave the right um, type of answers, um, or we can uh, use this uh, to test both perception and production. And here we can even do brain imaging studies of very, very young children. Uh, lots of this is being done with to test for uh, children's early auditory uh, discrimination tasks. And we can use this with older children to test other aspects of, of grammar as well. Elicited production tasks. Um, this is a classic task uh, developed by Jean Ger Ber uh, Berko years and years ago. It's called the WUG task. So you can take a novel word, a word that children haven't heard before. You can say, oh, look, he, this is a wug. Now there are two wugs. Very good. OK, so you know the plural. OK, excellent. So we can use this again to test uh, children's knowledge of various types of grammatical morphemes. And we can make the pictures as entertaining as possible. So most of our studies are pretty fun. Children typically have, have a good time with our studies. Here's another one. This is elicited imitation. This is good for two and three year olds who might not do the WUG task. So we can um, ask them to repeat. And as I said, they don't always repeat, but we can see if they do. So he runs fast. OK. And then again, we can see runs there. And we can see if they produce the morpheme at the end of the word. Another um, type of method that we can use, we've used this, we have a, a paper that's just come out with uh, using uh, imaging of the tongue using ultrasound. So that's an ultrasound probe that you see there, okay? And we, so using that, we can see what the tongue is actually doing, whether it's making contact in the right places in the mouth. Um, so we uh, just did a study with two and a half year olds uh, that's quite challenging. Um, we're just completing now a study with three to seven year olds, and this is from that study here. So here we're looking at, at the production of L, which is a hard sound for children to produce. Sometimes children don't fully acquire the sound L until maybe six years old. Um, so this child is about six here. And uh, you won't be able to hear the sound, but I'll play the video because you can see the tongue moving up and down. So, so this is actually the tongue uh, here, uh, right, right there, okay? And this is the front of the tongue, right here. So this is, this is in case you've never seen the tongue before, this is what it looks like when, you, when in speaking. And these are the words uh, that he's saying. So that pale, wait, and slip, okay? So those are just single words uh, that we're asking the child to produce. And then we get lots of recordings of those, and we can do analysis of what the tongue is actually doing. This is especially useful for um, children who have persistent problems with certain types of sounds. People have used this in, uh, in Canada to look at what happens with R, the production of R, children who have problems with R and giving them vial feedback so they can watch the video of their tongue and see what they're doing. And of course, uh, we can look then, use these studies, these baseline studies with typically developing children to explore um, how children who are developing bilingually learn, uh, learn language. Uh, we're right now running a series of studies looking at Mandarin-speaking children who have problems uh, with syllable structure and grammatical morphemes um, and getting a better understanding of what goes on there. 
children with specific language impairment or language delay um, also show protected acquisition uh, of grammatical morphemes. And of course, children with hearing loss, uh, lots of children with hearing aids um, can have problems with S and grammatical morphemes. Um, and we're also looking at uh, various other aspects with some of the partners here in the hearing hub. And all of this has then implications for more effective types of intervention. So, um, I would like to thank you all uh, for coming tonight. And um, I also want to thank all of the people who have been involved in this research. Um, this is a highly collaborative type of effort. Where, so my thanks to many of those up there, including all of the participants in the Child Language Lab, um, as well as uh, funding from various uh, research partners, including Macquarie University, and of course all the parents and grandparents and children who have been participated in many of these studies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was a very interesting talk. I learned quite a few things. Good refresher. Oh, very good. good. <laughs> um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, we have time for questions. Yes. Um, Professor, um, a lot of grandparents now are bringing up the grandchildren, and with hearing like mine, I don't hear there's no S and this sort of thing. Has that any effect that the children might be not getting the correction in their wording? Ah, or, you know? it, uh, that's an interesting question. So, as a grandparent caregiver, um, does your speech have any effect on the child or, or vice versa? Um, so um, probably not. Um, the, uh, you're probably fine. You're probably a great caregiver. Think of, um, think of the situation in a preschool. Who are the kids talking with? They're talking to other kids. <laughs> two-year-olds, three-year-olds who are, or other children who have just come from another country, or, uh, so, in a preschool environment, children are exposed to all kinds of language. And, in fact, there are studies where we can show that a child who is exposed only to one speaker using one uh, type of language is probably not going to be as good a learner and speaker of the language as a child who's exposed to a lot of different types of language. So it turns out for learning language, it's helpful to have a little variability in order to say, hmm, okay, yes, okay, this is what's going on. If they only ever hear that one thing going on, they're not as good a learner. So I certainly wouldn't worry about that. As to whether the child is speaking correctly, well, you saw the example of the child where he says, whatever, eat, and the mother says, oh yeah, he eats, and the child says, eat, okay? There's, we've known for a long time that depending on the uh, stage of development of the child, you can't correct them. It won't work. It, they, they are not responsive, okay? They can get angry. Well, so, so a lot of the correction that parents do do is more sort of politeness. Say thank you. All right, even that doesn't work sometimes. But, <laughs> but say thank you. But it, you, it doesn't really work to say, um, oh, you forgot an S on the end of that word, okay? Maybe when they're older, maybe, you know, at some later point, but certainly not at this age. So again, if you don't hear that they're doing something wrong, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> so, good question. Lots of questions. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is about, it's a selfish one. Uh, it's got to do with our particular situation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit, I guess it's a bit outside the norm, so hopefully it's got some interest for the others here. Yeah. Um, so we've got our first child, who in a couple of days will be 12 months. Uh -huh. Ours is a bilingual household. Mm -hmm. uh, both myself and my wife, uh, our first language was Armenian. Mm -hmm. 
but in both our cases, and especially in mine, our English is stronger. Mm -hmm. And uh, our Armenian is of two different dialects. Uh -huh. uh, and when we speak to our child, we most of the time, if not all the time, speak Armenian to the child. Uh, but when we converse with one another, not always, but often we will do so in English. And we've got concerns about language development mm -hmm. in that context and whether there's anything we can do not to com confuse the poor child <laughs> as it gets older. <laughs> Good question. Um, uh, children can usually figure it out. Um, so I wouldn't be so worried on the part of the child. Uh, typically what people say is uh, if you want your child to learn uh, your language, which may not be the language of the larger community, just keep on speaking it. Um, just keep on speaking it as much as you can because they will he overhear and hear from the rest of the community the larger community language. And, and yet, the only place that they can really hear Armenian, maybe with other extended family members, but you are the main sources for that language. Um, so, yes, the child will overhear you speaking English. Um, sometimes children think, ah, oh, they understand English, I can get away with just speaking English. I don't have to speak, you know, the other language. Um, so sometimes parents will try and, uh, you know, always only speak that language, but obviously if there's other languages in the home, the child gets exposed to that as well. The, uh, what often happens is that when there's a larger community language, the child may not actually speak the home language if they know they can get away with only speaking that community language, but they will understand a lot. And yet, if you go to a, a community where, or are in a situation where, say, grandmother is visiting, and, and it's only the home language, and they have no way of getting around that because, you know, grandma doesn't understand English, um, then, surprise, surprise, they may begin to actually speak um, that language. So, so it really depends on the larger environment. That being said, Children are, are individuals, and they can be different. Sometimes the firstborn and the secondborn show very different patterns of development. Again, it may depend on what's going on in the community. Typically, firstborns will speak a little bit longer than secondborns because older brother or sister is coming home speaking another language, and they identify with that instead. Um, so I would say carry on doing what you're doing, and if you have a opportunity for a monolingual um, experience for the child at some point that might give them a boost into really getting into the language. Um, but sometimes that's not possible. Um, hopefully they'll have at least a passive understanding of the language in the meantime. I just think it's important. If you know another language, I just think it's important that if you know... Yes, it's on. Uh, if, you learn, if you know another language, oh, yeah. to teach your child the mother tongue, mm -hmm. I was always told that too. The children will come home and speak the other language like English amongst themselves. That's right. Exactly. Quite, quite easily. But I think it's important, and I think one needs to have a sense of pride that you have a mother tongue that you can keep on speaking. And I think it's very, very important. So I go for that. The other thing that I wanted to say was surely it's important to speak to a child in a normal way, not babyish like and all this is, that's fine, but not, not, not in a babyish manner. I find that rather ridiculous because the child needs to learn the language properly. But this they is not go out and speak babyish. Well, but even there, uh, they'll be talking with those around them and uh, they'll eventually learn how to talk right too. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. One's about um, accent that my daughter goes to childcare and the people in the childcare speak English mm -hmm. with a very different accent mm -hmm. to, to us. And I'm slightly concerned about that. Mm -hmm. And my other question is um, about babbling. Should you, um, this is probably leaning on to your question, from your question, but 
I've seen two research papers. One suggests that one should, you know, when when Hannah's in there going blah blah blah, you know, actually imitate the same sounds back to her because she really enjoys actually hearing that sort of sound, but with changes in intonation. Mm -hmm. Or you shouldn't. Like, there's two completely different research papers, and I'm kind of interested in some more. That's, 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 that's research. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, there. I don't know that there's research results, but there's, there's certainly anecdotal evidence that um, children who are vocalizing early will tend to start talking early. Um, and so talking, talking to them, even if they're five months old, even if it means that you're also doing baby talk or whatever, it's really at that point the interaction that's probably the most important, just engaging with them and, and encouraging them to vocalize as much as they can. Um, just so that they feel like they're communicating whatever that means. Um, uh, that being said, look, you know, I have a sister and she still uses baby talk with a 13 year old. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I, right, right, right. But um, so that's probably, you know, it's probably not necessary to go on that long. Um, but, but the kid's normal. So, <laughs> so you know, um, kids often disregard what parents say anyway. So, um, yeah, it's probably okay. The other question was about the, um, the accent. accent. Oh, the accent. Yeah. Oh, um, the, um, <laughs> Here again, uh, children tend to develop their own dialect. Um, so I've had experiences um, in, actually in Africa where uh, they're at the university, it was an international community, and so a lot of people, it was very convenient to have their kids go to the preschool on campus, and there were, there were people from India, and there were people from Kenya, and there were people from um, America and there were people from all over and all their kids went to the same preschool and the teachers were also from you know an international group so they spoke all dialects of whatever um, and the children developed their own dialect <laughs> so so children are really very creative in creating their own language they tend to pick up the dialect of the larger community um, that being said, if the larger community is extremely multilingual, the, the children in the preschool or the school will develop their own dialect, which may be a variant of the larger community dialect. So um, certainly for um, a family, say, coming from Britain or coming from uh, North America, if they want their child to pick up their own dialect, Good luck, um, because the children will pick up whatever is the local dialect around them, um, and that's somewhat mutable. That can change uh, through the teens again, depending on the child. But after the teens, it's sort of set. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't worry too much. <laughs> How is it that children can pick up a language so much easier, quicker? In an adult trying to learn a new mm -hmm, language? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, we all wish we better understood that process. Um, but um, children are like little sponges. They're taking everything in um, very rapidly. And they're probably, as compared to adults, they're probably exposed to a lot more language uh, than uh, most of us in a typical second language learning situation. Even as an adult uh, living in another country, uh, you can read, a lot of what you read is probably in your home language. Uh, uh, you're, depending on the workplace, it may not be in the language of the community, et cetera. So, so part of it's probably exposure, but part of it also has to do with um, uh, development in the brain. Um, uh, children are extremely good statistical learners. They're picking up on the statistics of the language that they're learning and in all ways, all of the acoustic details, all of the grammatical details at every level of structure. It's really quite an amazing process and we don't fully understand why it's that way, but it probably has to do with um, aspects of brain development. Uh, people have talked for years about critical periods 
Um, some talk about five or six as being a critical period for language development. Um, others will say teenage years. Uh, so as I said, the, some of the brain maturation processes uh, begin to really uh, solidify around early teens. And uh, so probably some of language learning is determined by what's going on in the brain. And that's why children are so good. That being said, children aren't perfect immediately. It actually takes them many years <laughs> to become competent speakers of the language. Uh, so we could expect that for second language learners as well. So we should talk for one last question. This, this, last. this is a very small question, it's just bouncing <coughs> off what you just said a moment ago. You said the children in an international school setting spoke their own dialect. Has that, that really a dialect that they're speaking? Like, is well, it defined dialect? Well, what's a dialect? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there are different definitions of what a dialect actually is. Some people say, well, what's a language? How do you distinguish a language from a dialect? Some people would say, uh, well, a language is, is, a la uh, is a dialect with an army. So depending on where and how you are, uh, uh, what you speak is a dialect or what you speak is a language. Um, so that's taking it much further than, than you're talking about here, but, um, but any, any small variations in language, be it some of the phonology, some of the sound system, some of the grammar, uh, very, even lexical items, uh, you, know, you can say that those are uh, different dialects. Um, I mean, it, sometimes it can be very, very small. Uh, it turns out probably all of us in this room have a different idiolect. All of us have us maybe, you know, we may share 99.9% .9 of the same grammar, but that 0.1% might be just a little bit different. Um, and if we were to go off to some isolated valley and become part of a larger community, maybe that would grow into a different dialect over time. Uh, so. It's all really a gradient type of process. Yeah. All right. Well, I think it's getting a little late. And I think Catherine's done a wonderful job. Thank you very much. Gift to, to thank Catherine for her presentation. Oh my thank you very much. Thank you.